little heavier. I have to tell you about something I saw yesterday. First service heard about it. How many of you know what a fisher is? A fisher, it's an animal. It's like a big weasel, only a lot bigger. How many of you have ever seen one? I've seen it. Penny and I saw a de- one that was dying in the road last year out on Spring Street Extension. And I think I've seen them in the woods, but they're usually very elusive. And it's like, was that what I think it was? But yesterday, when I was coming to church in the morning, up on Wickham Road, you know, that little Y at the top of Spring Street, I was coming this way, and he came up from the area where they used to have a lot of, I think, chickens. It was in that wooded area near there. Came up the edge of the road and stopped. And he crossed in front of me and then went up the bank. He was huge. He was huge. N- now, I'm trying not to exaggerate, but... Based on what I saw, he looked like he was probably that big around. And his body without the tail looked like it was probably at least that long. That's without the tail. He was he was beautiful. He was sleek. He was dark. He was amazing. Isn't God an awesome creator? And he gave us the sunshine outside right now. Isn't he awesome? Can you give him a clap offering? Today we return to the Sermon on the Mount. Does anyone remember the topic of what I preached on two weeks ago? <laughs> False prophets. It was, it was a caution for you and me. Can you all hear me okay? Everybody hear okay? Okay. It was a caution for us to test people whom we sit under, whether on the radio, TV, and live, live in person, to test them by their fruit. And... Basically, it was if their fruit isn't Christ-like, reject all their teaching and walk away. Throw the baby out with the bathwater, I said literally. Because otherwise you can be influenced in ways you don't understand. Today is more about self-examination. Would you stand please for the reading of God's Word? I'm reading from Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. And if you're wondering, I don't believe I have a chest cold. Last Saturday was working in our den. If those of you who know, we demolitioned it last summer. So I got the first coat of mud on, trying to sand the first coat of mud off using a mask. And I think the filters got a little plug. And so I got some dust down in my lungs and my asthma is not happy. So (coughs) that's why I'm coughing and hacking and wheezing and praying that the Lord would heal me. (coughs) But if I breathe on you, you won't get sick. Not everyone, Jesus said. Now listen very carefully, because this is for you and me. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, that's the Greek word kurios, 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 did we not prophesy in your name and in your, and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Lord, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, please anoint the preaching of your word. Help me to deliver this, Lord, in your spirit without the flesh. I ask in Jesus' name you cover us with the blood of Jesus Christ. Bind the forces of darkness that would bring any hindrance bring confusion or noise to people's minds. Come upon us with your gentle, kind, loving spirit. Excuse me, that people would be open to what it is you have to say to your church this day. And Lord, I ask that this person who has trouble with his or her tongue, Lord, that you'd open that person's heart in Jesus' name. Amen. So before you are seated, that last part of that prayer I believe that there's someone here, really only one person. We all, many of us have issues with our tongue. That's well-known fact. But there's one person here that in seems like the last day or so has been so speaking with great passion but with venom, so much so that they were almost spitting. Uh, probably from her, but I'm not going to go beyond. But it was speaking so much venom out 
that there was almost like spitting, and uh, it seems that there's some connection between that person and the strawberries. And if that's you, rather than shut down, ask God. Ask God to draw near. Amen. You can be seated. It seems that, well, it doesn't seem, Jesus is talking to two different, he's talking about two different groups of people. Talking about two different groups of people in two different periods of time. Obviously, one group of people are those he's going to allow into the kingdom of heaven. The other group of people are those who will not be allowed into the kingdom of heaven. The two t- periods of time is are our present time, where whatever time we live in, that's the first. So for me, it's my lifetime. For George Washington, it was a long time ago. For Peter, it was even longer ago. For my great-grandchildren, it's still far in the future, if we are so blessed, right? The other time period is on that day, when each of us stands before God for judgment. Two groups of people, the two time periods. And now, why does this matter? For one reason... These three verses matter because there are some people who think that they're fine with God but are not going to enter the kingdom of God. Have any of you ever gone to some place and you found that either you weren't invited or you were invited but when you got there you weren't very welcome? Anybody ever? Go ahead, raise your hands. I've been there. How does that feel? When we get someplace and we find that we're not welcome, how do we feel? Uncomfortable. Maybe embarrassed? Can you imagine standing before the Lord thinking that you're fine with Him only to hear, I never knew you? What would that feel like? I think that would be the worst feeling a person could experience in the world. That's beyond anything any of us has ever felt before. Another reason that this matters is that people who say they're Christians aren't going to be of much help to people who, and they say they are, aren't going to be much help to people who aren't Christians. They might, they can witness, they can tell people about Jesus, but who's more likely to be the hypocrite? The person who's filled with the Spirit or the person who's not filled with the Spirit but believes he is? The person who believes he's filled with the Spirit but is not is more likely to be the hypocrite. And so, say you should live this way and do things that don't align with the Word of God. So, and people who aren't saved and who think they are, where do you, you know, divisions can come in the church from many sources, although it's one of the, it's one of the things that God deals with very harshly. He said, warn a division, device a person. I think it's once. Maybe it's twice, and then tell them, you know, have nothing more to do with them. He deals with that pretty seriously. If people aren't filled with the Spirit, do you think they're more likely the ones who bring division into the church and conflict into the body of God? Because what are they living by? Are they living by the Spirit or by the flesh? And if they're living by the flesh, are they living to live for others or ultimately for selfish motives? Selfish motives, which always usually leads to trouble. So what is it that God wants to say to us today? Church full of people, be sure that you are in Christ. It's not for me to determine if you're in Christ. It's not for your spouse or your parent or your child to determine if you're in Christ. It's not for you to determine if I'm in Christ. Although, better figure out if I'm born again or not if I'm going to continue to pastor here, right? This is a call for self-examination to be sure you're in Christ so that when you stand before the Lord, you won't hear, I never knew you. Now, how do we do that? Jesus makes a really clear distinction between two types of faith, I think, here. He makes a distinction between what is false faith and what is real faith. And so we need to measure ourselves by these two, by this distinction so that we can determine... Do I have real faith or not? The first type of faith is false faith. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, 
is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. False faith is that faith that depends on what we do. Did you catch that? False faith is when we depend, it's when we depend on ourselves. What, it's what it is that we do that we're depending on. False religions, even those that appear to be Christian, Jehovah's Witness and Mormon, they emphasize works. Islam, reincarnation, all that stuff emphasizes works, what we do. Sister Jean, what was it you said? We're not saved by good works. We're saved to do good works. And so, we need to ask ourselves, am I, am I focusing, is my faith focused on what I do? John Eiler, pastors, New, New Testament Church approval, and we've talked, we haven't talked in a long time, but in the past when we've talked, we are both in agreement that churches are full of people who are not going to enter the kingdom of God. How can I say that with a surety? Jim Cimbala in the book Storm, and I highly recommend it, Jim Cimbala in his book Storm cites some statistics that came from ChristianityAbout.com. And I've heard this from other sources. There are are those who say that 80% of the people, 79.5% of the population in the United States is Christian. And if you do some research, you'll find people who would tell you that. The 80, around 80% of the population of the United States is Christian. But I've got to ask you, and this is what Jim Simbola asks, are 8 out of the 10 people in your workplaces, your classes, your neighbors, your family, are 8 out now, maybe in your family, not my family, not my extended family, are 8 out of the 10 people you encounter Christians? In Symbola's book, he quotes John S. Dickerson, who wrote The Great Evangelical Recession. Dickerson writes that the majority who call themselves Christian rarely go to church, do not trust in Christ alone for their salvation, and don't value the Word of God as their, their main rule for faith and conduct. Tim Bennett said last week, And I love this. I want to remember this for the next time I'm talking with a Christian who won't go to church. You know, people will say, well, I'm born again, I'm a Christian, but I won't go to church. I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Remember what Tim Bennett said? What's that? Go ahead. Maybe you won't want to go to heaven. Because they're going to be there too. And what did he say? If If you don't want to sing in church, what else did he say? Maybe... Yeah, maybe heaven's not the place for you because there's going to be singing in heaven, right? Dickerson cites four studies, four surveys, four studies by four different researchers who had four different reasons for doing their studies, four different motivations, using four different methodologies, and they reached a unanimous decision about how many Christians there are in the United States. It's between 7 and 8.9% who are born-again Christians who love the Lord and serve the Lord who are going to enter the kingdom of God based on their confession of faith and how they live and what they believe. That means if you run into 10 people in a day or in an hour, you may not have encountered one Christian because not even one out of 10 is going to enter the kingdom of God. Sam, you're judging. No. I'm just adhering to doctrine that the Bible teaches. That Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Right? So, what, how do we focus on what we do? Well, these people who think they're going to enter the kingdom of heaven and won't, they say, Lord, Lord. Lord, Lord. They're, they're convinced because of how they talk. There are people who talk like Christians. They'll witness to people. They'll tell people, I love the Lord. I have had conversations with a young man recently who says, I pray, you know, I talk to God. He believes God's real in some sort of manifestation. And he'll pray. 
And I've met people in jail who will call Jesus Lord while they're in jail. I've met people out here who say that Jesus is Lord. They'll pray. They'll talk with you about God. They'll talk with you about church. They may go to church every Sunday. One such person came to me. There was a couple that I ministered to years, years and years ago who were living together. They weren't married. They were living together. She was a new Christian, tender-hearted before the Lord. He'd been a Christian a long time. He even witnessed to people. They came in because they weren't getting along. Do you want to know why they weren't getting along? I'll tell you why they weren't getting along. Just in case you were Snoopy and wanted to know. He would accuse her of lying. So I said, well, tell me the conversation. He said, well, it wasn't what I would call a lie. She might be dodging a little bit, but she wasn't lying. It wasn't even a white lie or a lie of omission. Well, every time that he felt that she was lying, you know what he did? He'd smack her. His word. Now, ladies, do you think you'd be more truthful or a little more likely to color the truth a little bit if every time your boyfriend or husband or whoever he is smacks you when he didn't like what he heard? Now, he's a Christian. He's been a Christian a long time. I have to believe that if he has the Holy Spirit in him, oh, I don't know if this is the Spirit or if this is the flesh, but you're going to get it. <laughs> that if the Spirit lives in him, there'd be conviction. That would say, knock it off. That this is not appropriate. Whenever we grab someone, we push them, we shove them, we hit them, that's wrong. I don't care if you're man or woman. Knock it off. And here's a freebie for you. This is a teaching moment. If somebody is abusive, there's what they call the wheel of abuse. And what the person will do is abuse. And then come up and with tears say, I'm so sorry I did it. And another step is, they make the person, the victim, think that it's their fault and they feel like they're crazy. It's called crazy making. But then the whole pattern starts again. And the victim begins to wear down and think, well, I'm the guilty one. And gets trapped. It takes several years away from that relationship to heal to begin to say, that was wrong and I shouldn't have put up with it. I do not trust somebody's apology or confession of faith until I see a brokenness. I want to see a brokenness. Because when the Holy Spirit comes in, we know that what we've done is wrong and we are heartbroken by it and we are heartbroken for what we've done to someone else and then we will go to great lengths to make it right. And until I see that, I don't trust it. I don't care about all the tears and all the apologies, all the groveling or anything else. All the nice gifts. So there's the freebie. There are those who trust in deeds. These people who come to Jesus and say, Lord, Lord, I prophesied in your name. I cast out demons in your name. I, I did miracles. See, they're trusting in their deeds. That their deeds are evidence that they're right with God. There are others who, you know, and that's primarily going to happen in a Pentecostal or Charismatic church, folks. Right? Pentecostal or Charismatic circles. Pentecostal or Charismatic evangelistic services. Our Baptist friends aren't going to run into that one too much. Right? But you know what others are going to run into? Well, I spent all day at Lowe's and Fishes. See, they're emphasizing their deeds and trusting that their deeds are going to get them into heaven. That their deeds... So many times we trust that our deeds are proof that we're born again. Who here is willing to be really honest? Willing to say, yeah, in the last six months, the doubt crossed my mind. What if I'm wrong that God, you know, what I'm wrong about this whole God thing? Anybody willing to be honest? That doubt crosses my mind. I don't hang out there and look at it, stare at it. How many of you have ever thought, am I really saved? That doubt crosses your mind. Oh, did I really get the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Word about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I reject, and the assemblies rejects it, the teaching that you're baptized in the Spirit and you don't speak in tongues. 
If you think you're baptized in the Spirit and you don't have the gift of tongues, keep seeking the Spirit. Seek for more of God. We believe it's the sign. But it's not the end of the road. There's so much more of God. Where was I? Deeds. That word, you know, in the NIV it says, Wait for me, you evildoers. That word for evildoers in another translation is lawlessness. And the literal translation there is lawlessness. Those who practice lawlessness. See, only the ones who do the will of the Father are going to enter the kingdom of God. Not those who are lawless. Well, how can people who are lawless and not going to enter the kingdom of God prophesy? How can they lay hands on people and heal them? How can they, and it doesn't say that there, but that would fall under miracles, wouldn't it? How can they cast out demons in Jesus' name? Look at Balaam. Numbers. The book of Numbers. The king of Moab, Balak, he and the Moabites were terrified that the Israelites were coming through. They're, they were terrified. So they went to someone known as a prophet. Balaam. We don't know if Balaam knew God or not, but he, when they came to him to pay him to come and curse the Israelites, Balaam said, I need to talk to the Lord God, the Lord Yahweh God. Not, not some other form of Lord like Master. It was Yahweh. I need to talk to him first. And God said, no. Pack them up. Send them on their way. You're not going to go curse my people. Balak didn't like the answer, so he sent another group of emissaries. Now, Balaam, on that second visit, should have said, you know what, God already gave the answer. But instead, he said, well, let me go see what God wants. Folks, if God gave you an answer once, don't keep fishing in the same well, because he might give you what you want. So God said to Balaam, go ahead. Now, how do we know that God wasn't happy with that? Because while Balaam was riding his donkey, his donkey started rubbing him up alongside a wall because he didn't want to go any farther. And Balaam started beating his donkey, and the donkey spoke up and said, Knock it off! I'm doing it to save your life, you low life." And then God opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw an angel there that was ready to part his hair, as Don Francisco says. He, God was going to kill him. Why? Because he wanted, he was greedy. So Balaam gets to the Moabite country and he prophesies and he blesses the Israelites every time until Balak says, Enough! You done just the opposite of what I want? But we know that Balaam wasn't right with God. Even though God used him to bless the Israelites because later on in the book, not the book of Numbers, but later on in the Bible in the Old Testament, we learn things the Old Testament, that Balaam, he couldn't curse the Israelites. What he did was he taught the Moabites, hey, you know what? You got good looking women. You let those Israelites marry with you and you're going to lead them astray. And so what happened was he taught the Moabites to intermarry with the Israelites and then because of that intermarriage, the Israelites began to worship other gods. And then God said, I'm sick of this. And he was already irritated with the Israelites anyway because they were a little bit hard-hearted and a little grumpy. So he spanked them. But you know, you know what he did to Balaam? He killed him. He finished what he was starting before. Just because someone moves in the gifts of the Spirit, they could be a false prophet, they could be someone who's walking with God and falls away. God can use anybody through the gifts. David Wilkerson tells a story in the biography that his son Gary wrote after David's death. And before David started Teen Challenge, he served as an evangelist. And he moved in the gifts with words of knowledge and healing and so forth. And this one day, he stood up there and he called out a man for healing. And God said this to David Wilkerson. Did I tell you to say that? Did I tell you to do that? Now, how many of you think that we're going to see David Wilkerson in the kingdom? I think so. Be a good fruit. But God warned him in that moment because David knew that God had not instructed him. Sometimes God will give an anointing and that anointing remains and God can use it, but the man's not walking with God. And while the anointing may continue and have miracles and signs and salvations, it doesn't mean that that man's going to enter the kingdom of God. And David repented. And he said, take it all away. 
it's more important that I have a relationship with you than I do this stuff. And then God said, what do you really want? What gift? And David said, the gift for souls. The MEV, the modern English version says in Psalm 78, verses 36 and 37, Nevertheless, they, meaning the Israelites, flattered him with their mouth, and they lied to him with their tongues, for their heart was not devoted to him, neither were they committed to his covenant. In other words, they said, I love you, Lord. See, you can come to church. You can worship. You can tell God how much you love him. But it doesn't mean you're going to enter the kingdom of God. Going back to the question of do you ever doubt, the temptation is that if God uses me prophetically, if he uses me to heal someone, if he gives me a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom, that must prove that he loves me and I'm saved. And that's not true. That is not evidence that we're going to enter the kingdom of God. Because what we're doing again is we're basing it on our deeds. Wrong place to put our faith. You can say, well, it's God working through me. God worked through a donkey. Jesus didn't die for donkeys. Jesus didn't die for angels. Jesus died for men and women, for humanity, for people. We're different than everybody else. We're different than the animals. Yes, God, the whole earth is waiting for Jesus to return because it's in birth pains. But Jesus died for mankind. Nothing else. Non-negotiable. Warren Wiersbe says this, there are many professors who are not possessors. There are many who will talk about Jesus, but they don't possess a living relationship with him. Do you begin to see, folks, please, God gives us this because he doesn't want us to get there standing before him and find out what I was trusting in was wrong. We, you and I personally, it's not for you to evaluate your neighbor, your spouse, like I said before, for you to examine yourself. Are you trusting in what you do? Even how God uses you, it's, is it still your words and your deeds? The alternative is real faith. Real faith trusts in Him. It's the difference between trusting in what we do or say and trusting in Him and Him alone. How can we trust in Him and Him alone? See, that's that ability to answer that, it's, it's the difference between black and white. It's the difference between life and death. It's the difference between understanding and never getting it. It's the difference between heaven and hell. That moment of revelation, when we understand and we realize, I can never be good enough to go to heaven. That Jesus really died on that cross and was raised from the dead and He did it for me. I don't care who else He did it for. He did it for me. And I need Him. When Jesus says, I never knew you, that implies that there are people He does know. And that word for know is the Greek word genosko. And it means to know. And it doesn't mean, I believe in the Easter Bunny. Or I believe that this was a Christian nation at one time. Or I believe that Nate has hair and I don't have hair. It doesn't believe, mean I believe in Jesus. It means that I have committed my life to Him completely. That no is an intimacy. And that same word is used sometimes where sexual intercourse is intended. When a man knows a woman, it's the same word. But this is where I need to get on my soapbox for a second. Every so often... There's extra biblical teaching that comes through the church and comes through the community. Well, Jesus was married. Jesus had children. Hold to the teaching of the apostles in the church for 2,000 years. When John said, there's more than I can, that I can tell you, more than I can hear, there's so much to tell. He was talking about miracles, what Jesus had done. I can prove to you that Jesus didn't have children. Isaiah chapter 53 Unjustly condemned, he, meaning Jesus, was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream, but he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. 
without ancestors. Folks, if you're going to live for Christ, you've got to know Him. You've got to know Him intimately. But that intimacy does not mean sexually with God. That is, a, that is a, an abomination and an abhorrent teaching. It is heresy in the church. I don't think that I've been too strong in my terms. If you don't like it, go talk to Dwayne Durst, my boss. My earthly boss. Go talk to him. See what, see what he says. Don't, don't come to me to argue with me because I just presented my case. I don't want to hear it. But if you want to know what the Bible teaches, get in the Word to know Him. How do we know Him? It starts first with John 3.16. Believe. Believe with all your heart. So much that you trust Him even though you can't see Him. You believe with all your being so that it changes your life. You can't believe in Jesus and not have your life changed. If you believe in Jesus, He changes your life. Then the second part of that, and it's required, kind of like required reading, right, Joel? Romans 10.9. We have to make Him Lord. We have to surrender all that we are. You can't say, Jesus is my Lord, but I'm going to do all this because I want to. If Jesus is Lord, thank you, Bonnie, I appreciate that. Thank you, Chad. If Jesus is Lord, He has the right and privilege to say, you let this go, you keep this, you change this. Until we surrender everything to the Lord, we're not His. He will change us over time, gradually, in a process, but it comes by totally surrendering. Folks, God doesn't... You know, I, I tell this to people and slowly their eyes get open and they live it and they say, wow, it's true. God deals with us like an onion. He doesn't transform... He transforms us from death to life in an instant. From lost to a child in an instant. Into a new creation in an instant. But in that instant, we don't leave the old man behind. He's still with us. And so, we learn to overcome him in what pleases the Lord through process. Because God is forbearing. And there's struggle. And so when we realize that we didn't please the Lord, we say, we acknowledge, confession is not just saying, I did it. We learned that in life groups this morning, but it's agreeing with Him that it's wrong. It's easy to admit, yeah, I did it. But there's a difference between, I did it, and you know what, you're right, it's wrong. So we've got to be willing to make Him Lord of everything, and He'll work with us. And there'll be times when we say, I don't want to give that up. And he's going to, he's going to pull. Or he's going to let you keep it. But in time, you've got to give it up. And the third part of it is, John 14. Those who love me will obey my word. Folks, the love we have for God can sometimes be goosebumps and overwhelming love. That's baptism in the Spirit is when we're so overwhelmed with His presence. And that can happen short of the baptism, but when you get baptized, that's really cool. You're, you're immersed in His love. But there are people who, because of their past, it's hard for them to feel God's love. See, the love here, to love and obey Him, isn't goosebumps and emotion and feeling. It's agape love. It's choosing to do what He asks us to. Sometimes at a cost to ourselves. It's right action. And again, our right actions don't earn us the kingdom of heaven. They prove that we have the kingdom of heaven. Well, Sam, you just said before that we shouldn't base our faith on our deeds. That's right. We base our faith on Him. See, the key is relationship with Jesus in living for Him. Knowing Him intimately. We can do all sorts of good works without knowing Him. And we, did, we cleaned up the world maybe, but we didn't help ourselves get into the kingdom. I love Penny. I trust her implicitly, completely. I have faith in her. I have more faith in her than anybody else on this earth. I trust her completely. And I can come home at night, and most nights I'm home. Well, every night I'm home. Every night I'm home. 
But some nights it's later than others. <laughs> and I trust that she always welcomes me into bed. I know that I'm safe. I know that we have that relationship. But if we didn't have a relationship, I know couples where the husband is not welcome in bed or the wife's not going to sleep in bed because they don't have that relationship. It comes by our love and care for one another. And it's not just emotion. It's doing kindness. It's doing. It's showing him you love him. He's ad living. The second part of this, Jesus said, you know, he, he, he keys in on the word knowing, but he says, those who enter the kingdom of God will do the will of my Father. It's obedience. It's doing what God the Father wants us to do. Matthew 16, 24 gives us great insight. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. Folks, Jesus didn't do what he wanted to do. In John chapter 5, he said, I do only that which I see the Father doing. How do we know that Jesus didn't always do what he wanted to do? In the Garden of Gethsemane. On the night he was arrested, one of the translations says in one of the Gospels, he fell down to pray. He was so burdened. He was so desperate. He didn't want to go through what he was going to go through. Be beaten. Mocked. Humiliated. And having the Father look away when he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In that instant, he became sin for us. And the Father looked away. The only time, the only time in Jesus' existence, and he's been alive forever, that he didn't experience fellowship with the Father. But also, because he has empathy, he feels what we're feeling, he knew what his disciples were going to feel. He knew the, the fear and the loss the overwhelming oppression. And he said, Father, take this cup away from me. Don't let... I don't want to do this. Let's find another way. Plan B. Right? He said literally, take this cup from me. He went back to the disciples and rebuked him for sleeping. Get up! This is important stuff. He went back and he said the same prayer again. But each time he said, not my will, but yours. See, Jesus is calling us to do what He's already done. To not do what we want, but to do what the Father wants. To deny what we want. Folks, when the Giants are in the Super Bowl, the flesh would like to say, Sayonara! I'm going to spend the day partying. <coughs> there are times in the fall when it's a beautiful Sunday morning. I grew up Sunday mornings going squirrel hunting. I would love to be out some of those Sunday mornings. Go on. Now, do I wrestle with it? No. The other things I wrestle with, fourth helping to macaroni and cheese. <laughs> Pride. Promoting someone else instead of myself. Do you hear that? What is it that God wants? Whenever we make ourselves the focus in what it is we want in our benefit, we're walking in the flesh. But when we deny that and say, what do you want, Father? We're walking in the Spirit. And we're walking in a way that pleases the Father. Timothy 2.19, 2 Timothy, brings us to a fine point. Everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. We can't live as we've been living and walk with Jesus. Let me bring this to a final illustration. When my dad was alive and I lived in his home, I could have done everything in that house. I could have fed the dog, which I did do. I could have cleaned the cat's box, which I didn't do. I could have taken out the garbage. I could have fixed leaks on the roof. I could have raked the lawn without anybody helping, without any word of instruction. I could have done all those things. And do you think they may have made my dad happy? Yeah, he may have said, cool. But you know what my father, my dad, my earthly dad really wanted? What he really, really wanted was two things. 
He wanted me to know him and love him and receive my love. That's one. And he wanted me to treat my mother and my sister well. If I treated them well, and I just... Because, doesn't it make sense? As I get to know him and I love him, I'll do the things he wants. And I'll understand for the times that he falls short. Because don't we all fall short and we want people to understand? But he really wanted me to treat my sister and mother well. If I'd done that, I couldn't. Have, I, I could have gotten away with a lot of other things. But those were the hardest things for me to do at that time. It wasn't lying, cheating, stealing, not doing good in schoolwork. It was treating them well. Our Father in Heaven wants us to know Him. To love Him, to appreciate Him. To receive His love. To, to know Him intimately. And to do His will. To love Him and love others. And sometimes that's in word and sometimes it's in deed. So where are you placing your faith? Is it on what you do? Even if you think it's God using you, is it still in those deeds, those works, those words? Or is it your relationship with Him? There should be fruit. If there's no fruit... I have three questions by way of application to ask yourself. Number one, have I let Him in fully? As much as within your power, have you asked Him and surrendered everything that He's shown you to Him? Or, or at least, are you in the process of surrendering everything to Him? Right? Because there's some things, you know, He could say, Sam, give up all your hunting stuff. Okay. It may take me a couple of days to make sure I was hearing from God and then do it. And then it may take me after I'm convinced that it was Him to get it done. Do you follow what I'm saying? Secondly, do I trust Him with all that I have, even the future? Do you trust him? This morning I hopped in the truck. Bub is his name. Chevy S10. 2001. 107,000 miles. Faithful as the day is long. I hopped in, started it, turned on the door. Nothing. I said, well, maybe it will come in as I drive down the road. I started to smell something hot. But it wasn't heat. So I turned it off, opened the window, closed the window. Doesn't smell like anything's burning now. Panic. Lord, this truck got to last a little while. Faith. Lord, I'm trusting you, you'll work this through. Right? Our first instinct isn't always going to be the right one. Because we got the old man with us. And he loves attention. But we can choose to, you know what, Jesus, you've been with me so long. Because God will see us through. The third question, am I denying what I want and following him and doing what he wants? Would you stand with me, please?